But the whole concept of serverless, to just kind of get your head around it, is to simply basically understand that you're trying to live in this new event-driven, ephemeral world. And the big way to, to, for people who've been doing development for quite some time that's really, really super hard is you're used to basically building an application, let's say on Node.js or Python on Flask or WordPress or Django, it doesn't matter what you build it in, and you're used to running the thing as a process in Linux and holding a port open, right? You hold 8080 open if you're running Tomcat. You hold some other port open depending on what the thing is. Port 80 if it's Nginx, you know, port something else. Ruby on Rails, 6000. You know, whatever you hold a port open, and that's the world you live in. You hold the port open and transactions come into that port. Typically HTTP-based transactions, but it could be something else. It doesn't matter, because it's a port, it's a socket, TCP stuff comes in, and then your thing responds to that. That is the world we've always lived in. But the difference in this new world is you don't have that anymore, okay? You don't have a socket open, a port open. You basically are responding to people in real time. And but, so therefore, somebody else has to hold the socket open, by the way. Someone else keeps this port open and you just respond to the messages. So it's a little different way of programming, different way of thinking. So I put this out there as my third in my series of Bruce Lee movies. This is the way of the dragon. This is where he kicks Chuck Norris' butt. And if you guys are familiar with all the Chuck Norris memes, you'll know what I'm talking about. So, and this fight scene, which is available on YouTube, by the way, I highly recommend you just go watch it, because it's funny as hell. <laughs> okay, so there is a whole exercise setup that I mentioned. The demonstrations I'll show you today come from these two GitHub repos. Again, we open source everything, and you guys are free and welcome to grab those image, uh, content, get clone it to your old hard drive, give me a pull request, give me a GitHub issue if you need to. So lots of people taking pictures of that, but if you have the bottom link here, you have access to everything, okay? <laughs> All right. So we're going to walk you through quickly. We'll skip the setup part, but I'll kind of mention how it works. But once you have Knative installed, it comes in three forms, and you'll see this in a second. Knative serving, Knative eventing, and Knative build, okay? And, you, and in this workshop, we would normally take you through the setup, set up your first serving, so Knative service, and understand revisions and configuration of routes, show you auto-scaling, and we'll show you that here. And then we'll show you build, and this is for the build-in cluster technology, which we'll talk more about in a second. And then eventing, which is where you have non-HTTP-based input. Right? By default, serving is HTTP. Eventing is not HTTP, necessarily. And one thing I want to show you before we're done here today is that the programming model with Knative actually blends the world of functions to microservices. If you've done any function-based programming, let's say on Amazon Lambda, you've seen that the programming model looks completely different than your normal Spring Boot application, okay? It's a different programming model. But with Knative, we can blend those two worlds enough together where it's actually the same code. The exact same code, which is a microservice, can now be a serverless service, okay? All right, so these three components, build, serving, and eventing, do know that build is more or less going away and becoming tecton, and we're gonna drill down on that later today with Kamesh, all right? So Kamesh is gonna really hardcore go into build and Tecton in particular, which is the new project that is where all that technology is going. But I'll just mention this. Understand why build is so important. It's actually so important that it got graduated to its own separate project. We have this feature in OpenShift known as S2I, source to image. Let me see if I can show it to you real quick. We have a source to image feature. We've always had this feature. I don't show it in most of my presentations because it's just something we've had forever and you know, I kind of ignore. But let's see here if I can show you this uh, project. Create a project, call this project, you know, stuff happens. So this is a namespace in Kubernetes. I'm just creating it, but I'm doing it all via GUI. I hit create here. You can see I got a bunch of namespaces in this cluster. Ah, and this cluster is acting up. So let's, this cluster is misbehaving. Let's go to another one. I've got a lot of clusters, obviously. And wow, now the network is nice and slow. All right, let's create one over here. The, experience, the, the technology is basically the same right the covers. So come on, create project. All right, stuff happens. Okay, and hit create. All right, come on now. View all, stuff happens. Where'd it go? Down here, there it is. And browse catalog. All right, so I'm showing you this pointy, clicky way of doing things. If you came to the earlier session where I showed you, you know, a deployment config with a, a deployment YAML, and we showed you to do a kubectl apply-f and all that, well, all that's automated by some points and clicks if you have OpenShift as opposed to raw Kubernetes. So this is something OpenShift does on top, all right? But I make the point of this because you don't have to do a Docker build here. You don't even need a Docker file, and there's a reason why this is important. I showed you how to do a Docker build earlier and how to run that Docker build, but you really, as an operations people, how many operations people we have in the house again? 
Yeah, so we normally get a lot on this Kubernetes side. You don't want to give developers the Docker build. You would love to remove that capability from their hands. You know, now the developer, especially me, we're going to argue that we deserve it, we need to have it. As a matter of fact, you can't do it for me. We will make that argument on the architecture side, on the development side, but you don't want to give it to them because you have no idea what they're going to put in that image. They're going to put a Bitcoin miner in there and put it on your infrastructure and you don't even know, okay? But they're getting the Bitcoin and you're not. <laughs> but basically, you want to make sure you know exactly what's going into that image. And therefore, the only way to know exactly what's going in that image is to make sure developers don't build their own images and put in random things from random sources with all kinds of crazy stuff that's in that Linux runtime. It's Linux. What can you run on Linux? Anything. Okay? So this is a technology that helps remove that skill set from the developer, but let them still be productive. Because the developer, they want to build, let's say, a .NET app. They want to build a MongoDB, Node.js app, a Postgres app. They want to build a Wildfly app, you know, whatever it is. Here, I'll just pick on Node.js, uh, and they want to get going. So they'll pick Node.js. They will basically pick the, their name, so uh, hello, we'll say. And, and they'll, of course, have to pick their GitHub repo, or not GitHub, Git repo, right? So if you have a private GitLab or whatever, that's fine. So they got to figure out where this is coming from, and that's all they do. No Docker file, no Docker build, no kubectl apply-f, no creation of a service, no creation of a deployment, no creation of a replica set, no pod. They don't have to worry about any of that. I like showing people that because you should know how it works, but you don't necessarily want to give the power of that to everybody. Okay? So now I have this thing booting, and let's go over here, overview. You can see it's coming online. So this will take a little while because it's literally doing a build right now. It's building in cluster. Okay? So let's look at builds, builds, okay, and latest build. And we can even look at the logs, right? So there's, it's actually taking the sources, wrapping it with the appropriate Docker file that it understands, not one, it's under operations control, not developer control. It's doing the build of that image based on the base image, one that's certified by Red Hat, so you know that it's bug-free, CVE-free, Bitcoin miner-free, et cetera. And then it'll pop out the other end as a ready-to-deploy thing. But I make this point because Knative build is to make these same kinds of ideas universal across all Kubernetes distributions. This is some Red Hat has always had, always had, and open source, but no one else ever had. Okay, so now it's kind of cool to see everyone else catching up with that. Uh, so that's really what I'm talking about here. So we can come back to that in a second. It does take a little while to do all that because it's doing a lot of magic in the background. Okay, so that's what Knative build is all about. Just be aware of that. We're going to spend most of our time on serving, which is kind of the more exciting thing anyway today. And then serving is HTTP-based load balancing or scaling. So by default, you get auto-scaling in Kubernetes based on CPU load, based on memory load. But that often is not the load that's the problem. The load that's the problem is all those users clicking those balloons, right? All those transactions flying at you coming through HTTP, that's the load that matters, and that's what I want to auto-scale on, and that's what serving allows you to do. That's kind of why it's so awesome, okay? And then venting, as I said, is for the same idea, but without HTTP. So let's talk about these things, and we'll get into this. Now, here's a key question I like to make sure people understand, not balloon popping and game playing, but you have to decide if you work for an organization that's in the former category or the latter category. If you go talk to three vice presidents of your company right now, and there's no one here that's a vice president, right? It's a developer day, operations day. It's not vice president day. But if you go talk to three vice presidents and you ask them this question, are custom apps and APIs a key strategic advantage for our organization? You're going to get three different answers. Often those people don't know. <laughs> okay? As a matter of fact, many of them may say, no, no, you guys are too expensive. If I could get rid of all of these programmers, I would. If I could move all that data center stuff to a cloud, I would. If I could just basically have the cost of IT for this organization, I would. You need to find a new job. That's the wrong organization to work for, and it's certainly the wrong vice president to report up to. You want to work for the former, not the latter. We are focused, and the reason you're all here today, taking your time from the day, a day's worth of work and spending time to learn things is because you want to build better software faster, you want to build next generation applications and APIs faster, because it matters to your organization. Okay? So I love this quote from Albert Einstein, we cannot solve the problems with the same thing we use to create them. This also means that for people who are mentally in the mode, and I see this all throughout the, all throughout the world, I speak to a lot of people around the globe, if you're mentally thinking right now, oh, this serverless stuff, it's just like CGI bin. Anybody thinking that? Nope, okay, you don't have to admit it. But I know someone here is thinking that. 
Okay, common gateway interface is how we used to plug into the back of app ser uh, web servers before there was an Apache web server, NC NCSA. So I get that point all the time. It's just like CGI bin. No, it's not, okay? It actually is very different. But if your mental model is, oh, this is just like the old crap I used to do, then that's the wrong mental model. It's actually new crap you're about to do <laughs> and have a lot of fun with. So if your application that used to get your head around looked like this, it basically had all these things inside it that we ignored. We bundled it up into one big deployable unit. We deployed it, but we had these modules inside it, hopefully. We had a nice modular architecture, but we started thinking about microservices and our application fades into the background. As a matter of fact, our application starts looking more like this distributed things, right? These components that end up around a network. And now we have this network connection across our different components, and this is where we start thinking about microservices. And of course, microservices have to have their own databases, because that's the way you give full independence. We're going to talk more about microservices in the later presentations. But now you have these multiple points of entry, you have these different API calls, and you think, wow, okay, I'm getting my head around distributed architecture, microservices architecture. This is why I need Kubernetes and OpenShift. I agree, this is what people are interested in. But look at this quote here by this pointy-eared fellow. He's not an elf, by the way you Lord of the Rings fans, <laughs> okay? The problem is, you know, all these microservices, uh, oh, well, actually, the slides got out of order again. So, changes the essential ex uh, exist process of all existence. This is the problem we're living with now. From a serverless architecture st standpoint, we not only have these long-lived microservice processes, we're now gonna have these short-lived executable serverless processes, okay? Functions, you might say. Things that pop to life, do their thing, and then go away. Okay, so it does change the nature of our architecture. So let's kind of go through that real quickly. This is just stuff you can read on your own. But there is a slight distinction between serverless and FAS. So function as a service is a very specific concrete implementation of function execution within something like Amazon Lambda, you know, Google Cloud Function, Open Whisk if you're from IBM, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna deal more with the serverless aspects, not the function as a service aspects here in this presentation. Serverless, by the way, has been around a long time. We've, not, we've been thinking about this for quite some time. As a matter of fact, the term was coined in 2012. If you remember earlier, I showed you the history of microservices. Serverless has been around a while too. And here's the part that's actually gonna be hard for us as IT professionals. We're still trying to catch up on the, oh, we gotta do containers, we gotta do microservices, we gotta do distributed computing, and this, another paradigm is coming right on top of it, serverless at the same time. So here you are learning one thing, and the new thing has already you know, passed you. It's the nature of our industry at this point. Things are moving ever faster, okay? Ever faster. So the key question to think about when it comes to this architecture, is there a service I can use versus one I have to build? If there are Java people in the room, this is gonna hurt your feelings. Java people wanna build their own databases. Java people wanna build their own message brokers. Java people wanna build their own MVC framework. They wanna build their own dependency injection framework. They wanna build their own ORM. Because they came from C++ people who did all the same things. But no, that's not the way we should think anymore. There's dozens of those things in open source for ORM, MVC, dependency injection, um, uh, messaging uh, broker technology like Kafka, AMQP based on AMQ, uh, based on ActiveMQ, things like that. Use those things, don't rebuild them. So that's really where you start thinking serverless because it looks like this. You're gonna have HTTP input and output, you need some form of API gateway. You're gonna have some form of SSO that you're gonna need to take advantage of. Don't build an OAuth server yourself, get one. As a matter of fact, there's a great one in open source that Red Hat sponsors called Keycloak. Wonderful service. You can basically stand it up, launch it as a pod in your Kubernetes, and now you have OAuth with single sign-on across multiple social providers, you know, Facebook login, GitHub login, all that for free. You don't have to do anything. It's part of it. Maybe you want some form of storage. Well, why would you recreate uh, Amazon S3? Why not just use Amazon S3? So it's a different way of thinking. You want a database, go find a database. Make it run as a service. You want a cache, don't build one, Java people. There are plenty of good ones out there, make them run. Messaging, again, we talked about messaging. Also push notifications or SMS and text messages. How do you notify a user asynchronously? These are all things that are out there. Now what you do is you fill this in with your business logic now, okay? Now you add your custom value add capability to these services that are out there. You don't recreate services that you can just use. You build your own stuff on top, okay? You have long-lived, large chunks of code that add your business logic, your business value, and those might be microservices, and then you connect the dots via these serverless function things. In other words, you have these event-driven components that can be rewired across the architecture, and of course, all of that supports an API 
that is consumed by your business partners, consumed by your desktop, consumed by your mobile devices and your users. So your backend architecture might look like that going forward. And so this is actually going to be very interesting. A lot of people have started moving in this direction. I was talking to a young man earlier today, basically is all on Amazon Lambda and doing this all on Amazon. But of course, you're now fully locked in to Amazon if you do it that way. What I'll show you is you're only locked in to Kubernetes. And the good news is, if you saw the demonstration earlier, Kubernetes runs everywhere. So at least you can run across any cloud, private, public, in between, it doesn't matter. Now, a couple of things to understand about your serverless functions versus your microservices, long-lived versus short-lived. This, you want to keep up all the time. Hold that port, stay on that port, stay on that process. You actually take great pride in knowing that your application will stay up for, you know, not just hours, but days. I'm kidding. You actually take great pride that the thing stays up for weeks and months and never has to be rebooted. That's what we do on the Java side of the house, for sure. Maybe we have to reboot that Node.js process a little bit more often. We love the fact that JVM can run for months with no problem. But that's different. Over here, that process will last approximately 90 seconds to five minutes. Depending on what architecture you're using, 90 seconds to five minutes. So you don't even have time to properly warm up the JVM in that setting. So this is why Java has not been part of the serverless opportunities that are out there. This is why everybody, again, in the serverless world is migrating to Python, Node, or Go. And that's another reason why we did Quarkus, because we can be as fast and small and warm up instantly and run in incredibly fast. As a matter of fact, let me show you a demo of that instead of preaching at you so much, just maybe get a, make this more real. Here, let's see if this system will run for me. This could go very badly, because again, that cluster is acting up a little bit. But here I have, let me do Kubernetes. I am in this side-by-side -side namespace on this system. Uh, and again, I could go to the GUI and we go digging into the GUI to see if we can find it. Uh, let's see here, let's go here. Oh, actually, let's go uh, view all projects. Oh wait, I'm in the wrong system over here. <laughs> I have too many clusters. Uh, side by side, here it is, okay. And so if you can see, there's nothing running there right now. Okay, there are these, uh, what are those things? Oh, see that it says zero pods? There are no pods running. So if when I say kubectl get pods, get pods, there are no pods running, okay? Because this was architected to be in a serverless setting. So by default, it's not a microservice that's always on. It is something that comes on as needed. So let me actually put a little load to it. So let's go to this Quarkus application. And I'm gonna send in a burst of load with a script here, it's using a tool called Siege, which we tell you to install if you run our tutorials. And it's running 40 concurrent users right now. So a burst of users just shot in, and it's just a curl command, by the way, it's just HTTP, right? Shoot in, and what Knative is doing is saying, holy crap, a whole bunch of people are coming, let me launch four servers, four pods, to respond to that 40 user load. And I did this on purpose, by the way, I made the concurrency 10. So that's one thing that's different than let's say an Amazon Lambda architecture versus let's say this architecture. You have control of those kinds of dials and knobs. You, you can set the concurrency not greater than one. By default, most function of a service solutions, concurrency is one. One transaction, one thing runs. I actually set this to 10, so therefore 40 transactions creates four things to run. But watch what happens if we just talk just a few seconds longer, Knative is clever enough to know, well that burst of load, well that actually was just a, an anomaly. I don't actually need to keep all four of those running. As a matter of fact, let me go ahead and keep something running here. Uh, okay, I'm actually gonna keep hitting it, but look, two of them are already being torn down. So the memory and CPU used by those, now three are being torn down, because one of those Java-based applications, Quarkus-based applications, can handle a single user pulling away. It could actually handle the 40 users again. It just so happens that you can put it in panic mode if it's totally asleep and you hit it hard fast, it'll try to scale quickly to the point, and again, you can determine how much you scale. But in this case, it's tearing it down and then it'll leave the one up. And if I actually stop this polar, it'll eventually tear that one down too. 90 seconds is the default uh, interval for that. And let me also do the same with my Node.js application here. All right, so let's do the burst on it, okay? And again, it's just, it's just going to throw in the 40 concurrent users. But here's the cool thing. Anything you can put in a pod is now treated this way. You got a Fortran application, a COBOL application, C++ app, doesn't matter. Knative doesn't care because it works off our container. 
It works off Kubernetes architecture. So literally, the burst here is starting four Node.js's, just like it would anything, okay? Uh, and there, it got one of them up, and then it'll, again, it'll go through the same process. It'll realize, oh, I didn't need to panic. I can handle more users, and it'll start tearing them down. Uh, again, even if I actually send in a second burst. So let's actually send in a second burst. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Okay, so here's the second burst. You notice there's no latency there, no cold start latency, because one thing is already up. So as long as something's up to respond, it doesn't hold that load, it just sends the load through. If nobody is up, it holds the load long enough to basically get a pod online so it can send the traffic through and get responses back. So just keep that in mind, right? You just have to, you just have to be aware of it. One thing that's actually very popular is to, in this space, is to not set the default floor, the bottom, to zero, but set it to one. So no user is ever waiting. One is the low win. But you then want to burst out to maybe five or 10 or whatever, need, whatever you need when all your users show up on Monday morning and all log in and run their first transaction. If you deal with New York banks, nine o'clock on Monday morning is a heavy load. When the door is open and every trader and every person and teller, et cetera, logs in. All right, if you, so depending on what world you live in, you're under heavy load under different points of the day. So you need to scale for that load, but you do no longer have to scale for that peak load all the time. So once we're beyond peak, release those resources so other people can use those resources. Now, see, now I'm no longer running all those pods, I'm just down to two. Well, maybe I can run my big data workload now, my big batch job for Hadoop because I got extra CPUs and memory. So that's the way you have to think, and that's why you care about this kind of architecture, is this simple thing. Uh, but let me show you this. I didn't show you guys this already, right? Make sure, I don't think I did, so let's see here. All right, let's check this out. This is Node.js memory. Yep, so Node.js memory, we'll zoom in here a little bit. It is running, we're at, you know, under 28 megs. This is Quarkus. All right, so you can tell by the name. Okay. See where it says Quarkus there? Uh, it's the pod identifier, so where'd it go? Uh, Quark, yeah, I call it Quark. So Java is a lot smaller than Node.js right now. Now, your mileage will vary. Every time I run this, the numbers come up slightly different. So normally, Java's smaller than Node. Java's faster than Node. Every now and then, Node catches closes the gap, but otherwise, it's pretty consistent, but they're pretty close, right? So here I am at 20 meg versus 27 meg. Seven megabytes doesn't mean much, but the important thing is, this is Java <laughs> that's running that fast and that small, okay? Here, let me run something else. Let me run a more traditional Java stack. Uh, we'll go over here, okay? And let's just run one of those so we don't have to wait for four of them to start. But again, the same thing, it's just a curl command that's coming in, and you can see it's running my little Spring Boot app. It'll take a little longer to get started because it is a normal JVM, uh, and you'll see that coming up, but let's, also, let's go ahead and check out our memory requirements. And uh, what's this, is this the boot one? I'm double checking, no, that's still the node one. So it hasn't even, picked up, it hasn't even been picked up yet because it's not even up yet, all right? So, okay, come on, a little bit, there we go. Now it's up, and now we're over at 100 and something megabytes. So we're four times larger than the Quarkus application, just in this one little use case. So it's, and depending on what you do, it actually, the savings gets greater, okay? Like if it's a real database application with an API, you can get greater savings. This is just hello world, okay? So I make this point, this is a new way of thinking, a different way of thinking. You're event-driven, you're responding in real time, and you want to write your application a little bit differently. Now what's cool about what Knative does is you don't actually have to change your code base much. Let me show you what that looks like. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, let's bring up the code base here for the Spring Boot app, okay? Notice it's just a get mapping if you're familiar with Spring Boot. If you're a micro profile or something, there's just at get or at post. So at get mapping, at post mapping, if you're Spring syntax. But all you need is a post that basically receives a cloud event JSON. That's it. That's the nice thing about Knative. You don't actually have to write your code in the Amazon Lambda way, or the IBM way, or the Microsoft way, or the Google way. You write it the normal way. And Knative still gives you that awesome auto-scaling 
that you would get from those other platforms. So that's why I like the technology so much. So, you know, it, you just have to deal with this JSON chunk now. That's all. All right? Because, and, and you only need this, by the way, if you're not using HTTP. Yeah. Because what happens is if you're using KDN eventing, it's bridging those events into this method. So it could be a Kafka message coming in. That's why it's the JSON uh, chunk right there. So if a Kafka message comes in, FTP message comes in, you know, text message comes in, whatever it might be. Okay, let's get back to this. And yeah, let me turn these guys off. And dun, dun, dun. And you should see, actually, our Quarkus one's already gone. The other two are still hitting, so, but they'll, they'll fade away after about 90 seconds. Okay, and we'll come back to that in a minute and talk more about it. Okay, let's see here, where do we go? Okay, so that concept of a short-lived process versus a long-lived process, a new programming model, a new programming model is true if you're living with Amazon Lambda, something like that. Knative, it blends the model. It is event-driven async, so you have to be aware that your component is waking up, doing everything it needs to do, and then going away. Very different way of thinking from the old way we built Java E applications. Spring Boot applications, the way we built Node.js applications. It doesn't matter. We're no longer holding a port. We're no longer keeping a process up. We no longer have a big old connection pool we built to the database, a big old thread pool, a big old cache, because it's ephemeral. It's going to go away in within 90 seconds to five minutes. All right, keep that in mind. Now, I do say that microservices are very mature. We actually have been building applications like this for 20 years. Microservices paradigm is just slightly different than the old monolithic paradigm where we had before. The serverless paradigm is fairly different. It is a different way of thinking. But we had IDE integration, debuggers, tracers, monitoring. We had all that figured out. CI, CD, in the serverless world, eh, it's still kind of new. We're still figuring these things out. How do you debug the thing that comes and goes? Because a debugger normally attaches to the process, connects to a port, except, expects that port and that process to stay around a while as you walk through the breakpoints on it. What if you don't have that? <laughs> now, the cool thing is, with Knative, because the programming model is the same, you can actually start it as a microservice, do all your work against it, and then flip it as to a serverless function. Let me actually, I'll show you that. Because um, I think that's actually a very cool thing, and I actually don't show this to a lot of people. But let's see if I can make this work, okay? Because on, the, on this application, I'll just go back to Quarkus here. If you actually look at the code base, and it works, it doesn't matter what it is. If you look at my code base here, I actually have different ways of deploying the same application. So here's my application. Again, Quarkus is based on microprofiles, at get, at post, things like that. But I also have a regular deployment and a regular service to deploy it. So in other words, I can deploy it as a normal microservice. I don't have to do anything funny about it, so let's try that real quick. I can basically come over here now, and if you saw our earlier presentation, this is in kubefiles, I can say kubectl, apply-f, kubefiles. I can do this the old school way, deployment, and let's, let's just deploy the Quay.io one. And notice, by the way, all my pods are gone, because we talked long enough that they disappeared. But here's now the old deployment model. This is not the Knative deployment model. I'm using a different YAML file. I'm using the, a traditional deployment, in this case. And kubectl apply, dash f, kube files, and there was the service, YAML, OK? Morning, uh, I don't know, I don't say get, did, uh, yeah, you're supposed to create with that. Get, sir, let me see what it did though. Uh, do, 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 do. Did it create? Okay, maybe not. Uh, here we go, no problem. Great, 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 all right. All right. It helps if you spell create correctly. And, dun, 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 dun. All right, go, 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 go. No, oh, it did create, so get, get services. Quark. Oh, that's because, oh, it's got the, I have the other old one there too. All right, hold on, I can fix this. Um, give it a different name. There we go. There we go. And, uh, <laughs> right, we've got to match it. So I'm just trying to get this uh, in sync and it's so it doesn't overlap with everybody else. So that's fine there. And actually, let's go ahead and give this mice will be consistent. All right. All right. So kubectl, get deployments. As you can tell, I'm just kind of a hacker. Is that not obvious? <laughs> Come on. kubectl, get deployments. Uh, dun, 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 dun. All right. So we're going to kubectl, delete deployment. Let's delete the corked one. 
because it overlaps with a name from something else, so we don't want to do that. And let's try this again. Notice I deleted the deployment, so that one's going away. kubectl apply, dash f, kube files. Let's do that deployment again. And I'm, I basically, oh man, I made a typo in here someplace. Uh, where did I typo it? This is the one problem with YAMLs. All right? You guys see the error I made? These all look good. I don't think I messed that up. And you can see, though, where it's pulling from. I don't, oh, you know what? <laughs> okay. It doesn't like uppercase. Yes. I always forget that. You know, I'm old school. I think camel case. But you shouldn't use camel case. Let's see here. QCTL. Apply dash F. And Q files. And then, yeah, deployment. Let's see if I got it right this time. There we go. And we should see that pod come to life. Now it says corked burr. Let me go ahead and fix my service, though, because I had a camel case there, too. Dun, 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 dun. So there's a good tip for you. Don't use camel case. And my brain is so wired for that because, you know, too many years in programming, right? Uh, so create dash F, Q files, and then service. All right, come on. All right, so the service is up. QCTL get uh, services. Rep, corked, burr. So I, what I did, though, is I just went through a normal deployment. And look, it does have actually a public uh, address already. Let's see if that'll work for me. Curl, and nope. Nope, 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 nope. Let's see here. Uh, well, let's do this. Uh, OC, expose, service, corked, burr. Let's just get a route out of this thing. Come on now. But this is a normal deployment, a normal microservice deployment. Q, uh, CTL, get routes. You notice I switched to OC there because routes are, again, specific. So, so in this case, it gives me a nice URL. So let's try that. Curl. There we go. So there's the application running as a microservice. It won't scale down based on no load. It'll just stay up and running all the time, living on that port, living at that endpoint. And, and so that's the cool thing is your code runs that way or the Knative way, OK? Because the Knative, the only difference is, if I go over here again, I have a different set of YAML. You can see I use it here. It is a kind service, but look at the API version, serving Knative dev. So it's a different type of service. And you, when you deploy this service, it actually does a bunch of interesting things. OK, so let me actually tear down the uh, deployment. Let's get rid of it, corked, burr. All right, we'll get rid of that one and the service as well. Just go ahead and just remove that out of our way. And watch this, kubectl get deployments. Or actually, more fun, kubectl uh, get deployments. Uh -huh. Let's watch it. So you can see I actually do have three deployments here. I didn't create them, though. I created Knative services, which created deployments. So like a deployment creates a replica set, creates a pod. We now have one more abstraction layer further up that hierarchy. You create a Knative service, which creates a deployment, which creates a replica set, which creates a pod. OK? So you can see there's three deployments here. And if I come over here and do kubectl get k service, I now have these things called k services. So this is actually a pretty advanced idea. Let me kind of drop this on you. This is a command you need to make note of, kubectl get crds. Always run that command on any cluster you talk to. It should normally come back with nothing, but often it'll come back with all kinds of stuff. CRD stands for custom resource definition. It allows you to extend the schema of the API. You can basically load a CRD into your Kubernetes cluster. It's an amazing feature, by the way. And now you have new schema, new object types, new kinds that you can deploy against. So to really, maybe to make that point a little bit more aggressively here, uh, let's see here. Dun, 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 OK, kubectl get um, pods. Where am I at? I'm still, well, well, who am I connected to? CTL, get namespaces. Maybe this guy's no longer connected. Oh, there it is. OK. So instill that side by side. So let's switch namespaces real quick. Create. Well, kubectl create. Uh, whatever. Namespace. Whatever. Let's try this for a second. Uh, kubeNS, whatever. 
And all right, there we go. We flipped over. kubectl get all. There's not much running here, except you'll see some Knative stuff, and you can ignore that for now. Oh, come on, get all sometimes is very slow in this cluster. I don't know why. Come on, come on. Well, we're not going to even wait for it. OK. Uh, kubectl get CRDs, grep, Kafka. I have a CRD called Kafka. That means I can do things like kubectl get Kafkas. And I can deploy Kafkas. Let's try that real quick. Uh, here, here, and here. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, dun, dun. Let's try it real quick. Just to make the point of what a CRD will do, let's kind of show you what that looks like. I want, let's say I want Kafkas. Uh, here's hello Kafka. Notice the kind says Kafka. And uh, Arun, I'll just pick on a different person here. There's got to be an Arun in the room, right? Uh, I just say that because I have a lot of friends named Arun. But now I have that Arun cluster, and I can say kubectl. Uh, apply dash f cube files uh, and then it was, it was called hello cluster was the file hello Kafka watch kubectl get pods watch what happens here okay kubectl get Kafka's now we have an Arun cluster Kafka object I can do the normal things I can describe it I can edit it I can talk to it Arun cluster like here's that editing thing I showed you earlier so there it is that's the Kafka object in the, in the system now. And yep, I didn't make any changes. Oh, this is a little slow today. This cluster has gotten a little slow on me. But if we wait just a few seconds longer, oh, I know why it's so slow. I've scaled it down. That's one problem. And you guys might, know, might not know this. As a, I decided I didn't want to pay so much money, but you know, I hadn't thought about it. And this actually will take a little second or two. But let's add a couple, let's add a couple servers to our mix. Yeah, yeah, come here, all projects. Yeah, I took, I'm down to almost no servers. So let's kind of crank that up. OK. Let's add a couple more servers to the mix. It'll take a little, oh, this system has got some issues. There we go. Um, but it'll take a little while to bring up those servers. But basically, if you watch on the Amazon side right now, you'll see some new servers coming online. Let's see here. It, and it takes a few seconds. Um, and I added them in AP South A. So it'll take a couple seconds to bring those servers online. But let's see here if this will finish. Man, it's really running slow for me today. But basically, and it might be that we're out of resources on the cluster. But what you'll see is zookeepers, three zookeepers, three Kafka brokers, starting based on the fact that I declared a new Kafka object. So understanding what CRDs do for you, because that's basically how Istio is implemented. That's basically how Knative is implemented. kubectl get CRDs, grep Istio. Oh. It helps if you spell Istio correctly. You can see there's a bunch of Istio objects. And if you sat through the Istio session, you worked with these virtual services. You worked with these destination rules. In the case of Knative, get CRDs, grep Knative. You work with a Knative service, Knative. Uh, and you can see there's revisions, routes, serverless services. <laughs> services. Those are the objects you're now dealing with. So you can deploy those objects into your Kubernetes cluster in, in a very simple way. OK, so we have here, what was I doing here? OK, there's my deployments. QCDL get pods. Oh, I'm in the wrong namespace. Let's see. Uh, that, that, OK, we'll come back to you in a second. All right, let's switch back to the right namespace, side by side. OK, there's our three deployments. Notice it says 0 of 0, because we don't want a pod running right now. But if we apply some load, let's hit this guy over here, the Node.js guy, watch what happens. Zero of one is ready. We need one because we have load coming in. So what Knative is doing is simply manipulating those values, the replicas. If you were in my earlier session, I showed you how you could manipulate the replicas. That's what it's doing. Okay. The thing that's clever about it is it knows to hold the inbound transaction. The user is not getting an error. It's just hold it. It's holding, and it's going to wait until we eventually get something up to respond to that user. And so you'll see it's going through its full life cycle here. You can see it's 0 of 3. By, by default, Knative has two sidecars, the Istio sidecar and the Knative sidecar. You can, of course, configure it with only one sidecar, and actually, that's what we recommend. If you're not using Istio for Knative, don't add the Istio sidecar. The Istio sidecar actually is a little bit heavier than you might want, especially in this dynamic auto-scaling world. All right, So we actually will recommend turning that one off. But I want to show you the 3x3 three three here, because there are two additional sidecars added. You can see we're now 1x1 one one here. We're getting user responses. 
If I stop the load, you'll see this go, come back and say, oh, you don't need this pod anymore. So that concept of manipulating the deployment that we showed you earlier with regular Kubernetes still applies here. It's just Knative is doing that now as opposed to you manually. That's the difference. Instead of you, the operations team, changing the number, Knative is changing the number on your behalf. So if I stop the load, we wait 90 seconds, it goes away. That, by the way, is configurable. And I want to I want to see if this actually came online. What was the name of that namespace? It was whatever, right? Uh, dun, 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 dun. Man, I got to go back and figure that out. Kubectl, get Kafka's. Yeah, so the cluster's there, and it's four minutes old. So those should be coming to life. Okay, we'll worry about that later. Okay. Uh, all right, let's get back into this. Let's see, I'm, I'm wondering if those two servers I asked for, are they coming online? No. Something's really wrong here. <laughs> okay. But let's go here. Okay. Let's kind of, we got about 10 minutes left. Let's kind of rock and roll through the rest of this. So the way to understand function as a service is there's a number of function as a service engines running in the Kubernetes ecosystem. You might have heard of Apache OpenWhisk by the IBM team, FM Project from the Oracle team, Rift from the Pivotal team, OpenFAS is just an open source project run by a guy named Alex, right? But these are the more popular ones you see in the ecosystem, and they can all run on your Kubernetes cluster. As a matter of fact, the Red Hat team helped, uh, helped uh, bring OpenWhisk to Kubernetes as an example. We did a lot of the engineering effort. But these are all different players that are out there in the ecosystem. So why did we do this thing called Knative? All right, why did Knative become born? Because, and it was born a year ago, by the way, in Ju uh, July 24th, 20 2018. But why is Knative here now when all this other stuff existed? It's because they were all doing the same things again and again and again. In other words, they were all building a solution to build an image on the fly. They're all building a solution to auto scale on the fly, right? They're all dealing with event binding. They're all dealing with observability. So why not bring all that commonality into a central project, open source project that everyone can collaborate on and only worry about the special sauce on top? So in other words, all those function as a service providers can then build the function programming model they want. They can build a developer experience with a clean CLI that they want. They can add event sources that will connect to all kinds of cool things on their backend systems and add value there, but the stuff that's shared across all those functions of service players should be shared, a shared library. It turns out that in the year that we've seen this project being born, it's not really played out that way. All those independent players still want to be independent, okay? But at Red Hat, we're looking more at this from the global good, and we like the shared aspect of it, so we're focusing more on Knative, all right? And that's just where we are right now. So, Kubernetes-based platform for serverless workloads. These are base primitives. So if there are parts of this you feel are better, rather clunky or harder to use, it's because they are primitives. You're supposed to build on top of this architecture. And so the most advanced thing is that serving thing I just showed you. It's easy to use. You just have to declare the right serving YAML, and you get it for free, right? It basically scales up, scales down, that kind of thing. All right, scale to zero, scale from zero. That's the part that people really like in this architecture. Uh, you also have the concept of configurations, revisions. In other words, it's con it's, every time you make a change, it's keeping a new revision in its architecture. So you can actually roll back very easily. You don't have to do that manually, right? You can, you can always do that with a blue-green deployment with different deployments and old school Kubernetes, but this one kind of has it built in out of the box. You can always roll back from a revision to revision. Um, they also have the in-cluster image building, which you'll hear more about when you, like Kamesh talks about Tekton. And of course, traffic splitting. And you can kind of see what it looks like here. It is, it does, early on, it was based on uh, Istio, but as of right now, the Knative team is splitting from the Istio team and not making that a dependency any longer, simply because of the fact that Istio does all kinds of really awesome stuff, but often you don't need all that awesome stuff in a plain old serverless architecture, therefore you shouldn't have to pay for that overhead. It's kind of the idea. And we've actually benchmarked this a lot and demonstrated there are many opportunities to split those worlds. Okay, again, this whole thing is a bunch of ex exercises you can get at the Bitly Knative tutorial. Definitely check that out, and you can do this thing hands-on. Kamesh wrote the tutorial, so you can actually try it out uh, at GitHub. But just to show you the getCRD thing, remember that? Remember that command, kubectl getCRD. Then you know what your cluster has available to it. What are the extra things it has? You can see this is the ones we're serving. And here's, uh, you can also edit the config map to change the autoscaler, though this no longer works, by the way. <laughs> so it used to be that you could edit the config map and change the auto-scaling behavior. That doesn't work anymore, um, though it's still on my slides because it was an awesome, cool thing to show you. I could actually change the concurrency value, change the scaling value. That doesn't work. So, 
but here is what you would deal with in an old school Kubernetes deployment. Deployment, replica set, service, that gives you pods, right? I just showed it to you again. I could basically take any image, a deployment and service, and make it a microservice, right, running inside Kubernetes. Here's what it looks like when you add Knative on top. Your deployment is still here. Your replica set is still here. Your service is still here. Your pods are still here. It's just that now Knative is in charge. It determines when that deployment is created, when that service is created, when those pods scale up and show up. That's, all, that's really the biggest difference. And there's this other infrastructure here, so that it actually holds that load as it comes into the architecture and basically causes all those other things to spin up dynamically on command. Okay? That's what the auto activator is for in the pod auto scaler. And let's see here. There is the Knative build we you mentor earlier, but we're, we're going to skip that for now. Uh, there's a bunch of cool things you can do there, but that's what you'll see in Kamesh's Tekton talk. And let's just talk briefly about eventing. Eventing is where, again, if you don't want HTTP autoscaling, you want Kafka autoscaling, that's what you would have here. All right? And the trick is it comes to that post method again. You just have to have that post with the uh, cloud JSON that I showed you. All right, a bunch of resources. Let's go back and look at a couple more things, though. I want to see a couple more things here. One, I'm curious to see if that Kafka thing came online, because uh, I'm wondering why and uh, whatever why it acted up on me. Get pods. No, interesting. So kubectl, kubectl, get Kafka's. I wonder if this works. O wide. No, let's say get Kafka's. Dun, 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 dun. kubectl, get Kafka's, dun, dun. right? Describe. It looks OK, but something is definitely going wonky here. But the whole concept, and what I was just trying to show you with that, is that simply that the YAML you throw at it, like this one right here, whether it be a Kafka one, or it be the Knative service one, if I go back here, dun, 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 here, OK? You can basically, it's just the YAML that's the difference, right? So you basically you say, I want a Knative service. And also, you'll notice that everything in the spec section looks just like a deployment. It's actually the same syntax as a regular old deployment. You can copy and paste your deployment into this section, and then you get Knative serving. Okay? So you can kind of see it's the image, it's the resource. If I, in my earlier presentation, I showed you image, resources, liveness probe, readiness probe, all that same stuff applies. So you can basically copy and paste that. So if I go here to my, like my deployment, see it's, it's going to be identical from this point. Okay? So just keep that in mind. This stuff would be the same between those two worlds. Right there. OK. And actually, by the way, this, uh, because Knative is still 0 0.7, it's still changing. It's breaking back into compatibility. So you've got to bear that in mind. Uh, as a matter of fact, this syntax has changed slightly here in the latest version. We just haven't updated yet. And you can also see this annotation for determining the concurrency value. Remember earlier, I sent 40 requests in, and four pods came to life. That's set by that 10 right there. OK, if I make that number 1, you'd have 40 pods trying to come to life. And so by default, on a normal serverless architecture, that number is often one, right? In the Amazon Lambda world, that's how you should think of it. However, we know that a nice Node.js app or a nice Java-based app can handle a lot more than a single user. So I made it 10, but honestly, the default value is 100 in Knative. 100 actually will work fine, right? A Java-based app can handle 100 concurrent users, no problem. A Node.js app can handle concurrent users. A Flask Python app, maybe not. And I can say that because we tested some of these things. So just bear that in mind. Uh, Python and G-Unicorn, no problem, right? Um, so just keep that in mind that you do have to think about that. You should also remember how long the job ha takes to execute a request. So in other words, if you actually, ha uh, and you can test this with Java. In your application, put in a bunch of sleeps. Put in a sleep for two minutes. So that actually will create a greater backlog of transactions because this job is taking so long, and that doesn't have an impact on your concurrency scaling value here. If you have a job of task that takes two minutes to execute because it's doing all kinds of crazy stuff, gathering a bunch of data, running an inference engine for AIML, and this is specifically where I saw this, right? I was running an inference endpoint that was a machine learning trained model. It took a lot of memory, a lot of CPU, and took a while to respond. In that case, you know, you might actually have to make your currency value a little bit lower because this job takes so long, you need another pod to spin up to handle the next request. So you can test it easily, like I said, by adding sleeps into your code just to see the the, the changing of behavior here.
Okay? Let's see. We're, okay, let's go and wrap up. Uh, or at least we'll open up for some questions. There's a bunch of resources you should be aware of. Kamesh has written a bunch of different blogs that you should check out. There's, of course, the database book. We mentioned microservices. This is actually done by Edson Yanaga. If you have a monolithic database, do consider what it means to work, work in a microservices world. Great, great tips and techniques there. The Istio book we mentioned earlier, and you've seen all these books that we talked about earlier. Okay?